and it is a great pleasure uh, to be here, and thank you for inviting me. Mixing foreign policy and politics is an invitation I could not pass up. It's a pleasure to be here for the George Mason University, which is named for one of the many great contributors to the best form of government on earth. As prescribed by our Constitution, which George Mason helped write, we will be electing a new president in 2016. I enjoy challenges, and certainly we have many facing America. Today, I'm formally entering the race for the Democratic nomination for president. Thank you. If we as leaders show good judgment and make good decisions, we can fix much of what is ailing us. We must deliberately and carefully extricate ourselves from expensive wars. Just think of how better this money could be spent. For instance, our transportation network is deteriorating and becoming dangerous. We should be increasing our investment and priority in public schools and colleges. This is especially important in some of our cities where there's a gnawing sense of hopelessness, racial injustice, and economic disparity. We can and should do better for Native Americans, new Americans, and disadvantaged Americans. Let's keep pushing to get health care coverage to more of the uninsured. We can address climate change and extreme weather while protecting American jobs. I believe that these priorities, education, infrastructure, health care, environmental stewardship, and a strong middle class are Americans' priorities. I'm also running for president because we need to be very smart in these volatile times overseas. I'd like to talk about how we found ourselves in the destructive and expensive chaos in the Middle East and North Africa, and then offer my views on seeking a peaceful resolution. There were 23 senators who voted against the Iraq war in October of 2002. 18 of us are still alive, and I'm sure every one of us has their own reasons for voting no. I'd like to share my primary three. The first reason is that the long, painful chapter of the Vietnam era was finally ending. This is my generation, and the very last thing I wanted was any return to the horrific bungling of events into which we put our brave fighting men and women. In fact, we had a precious moment in time where a lasting peace was within our grasp. Too many senators forgot too quickly about the tragedy of Vietnam. The second reason that I learned, the second reason that I voted against the Iraq War Resolution was that I learned in the first nine months of the Bush-Cheney administration prior to September 11th not to trust them. As a candidate, Governor Bush had said many things that were for the campaign only. Governing would be a lot different. For example, a campaign staple was, I'm a uniter, not a divider. He said very clearly that his foreign policy would be humble, not arrogant. And he promised to regulate carbon dioxide, a climate change pollutant. These promises were all broken in early days of his administration. And sadly, the lies never stopped. This was an administration not to be trusted. My third reason for voting against the war was based on a similar revulsion to mendacity. Many of the cheerleaders for the Iraq war and the Bush administration had been writing about regime change in Iraq and American unilateralism for years. They wrote about it in the 1992 Defense Planning Guide, in the 1996 report to Prime Minister Netanyahu, in the 1997 Project for a New American Century, and in the 1998 letter to President Clinton. A little over a month before the vote on the war, back in 2002, I read an article in The Guardian by Brian Whitaker. Listen to this, quote, 
In a televised speech last week, President Hosni Mubarak of Egypt predicted devastating consequences for the Middle East if Iraq is attacked. We fear a state of disorder and chaos may prevail in the region, he said. Mr. Mubarak is an old-fashioned kind of Arab leader. In the brave new post-September 11th world, he doesn't quite get it. What on earth did he expect the Pentagon hawks to do when they heard his words of warning? Throw up the hands in dismay? Gee, thanks, Hosni. We never thought of that. Better call the whole thing off right away. They are probably still splitting their sides with laughter in the Pentagon. But Mr. Mubarak and the hawks do agree on one thing. War with Iraq could spell disaster for several regimes in the Middle East. Mr. Mubarak believes that would be bad. The hawks, though, believe that would be good. For the hawks, disorder and chaos sweeping through the region would not be an unfortunate side effect of the war with Iraq, but a sign that everything is going according to plan." End quote. It's bad enough that the so-called neocons, most of whom had never experienced the horror of war, were so gung-ho. But worse yet was that they didn't have the guts to argue their points straight up to the American people. They knew there were no weapons of mass destruction, but they wanted their war badly enough to purposely deceive us. After reading the Guardian article, I asked for a briefing from the CIA. I said, I have to vote on this war resolution in a couple of weeks. Show me everything you have on weapons of mass destruction. So I went down to the CIA in Langley, and after an hour-long presentation, the answer was, not much. Flawed intelligence is completely inaccurate. There was no intelligence. Believe me, I saw everything they had. So it's heartbreaking that more of my colleagues failed to do their homework. And incredibly, the neocon proponents of the war who also who sold us on the false premise of weapons of mass destruction are still key advisors to presidential campaigns today. So now, without a doubt, we have prodigious repair work to do in the Middle East and North Africa. We have to change our thinking. We have to find a way to wage peace. Let's have a rewrite of the neocons' project for a new American century. It is essentially the opposite of everything proposed in the original. We will be honest and tell the truth. We will be a good international partner and respect international agreements. The 70th anniversary of the United Nations is June 26 in a few weeks. And the preamble to the UN Charter says to unite our strength to maintain peace and security. We can do that. Unite our strength to maintain peace and security. Let's reinvigorate the United Nations and make the next 70 years even better. As part of our efforts to wage peace in this new American century, let's be bold. Some of our bravest and most patriotic Americans are our professional diplomats stationed all over the world. It isn't an easy career, and they deserve the best in support and respect. As president, I would institute a ban on ambassador ships for sale. That means no more of these posts going to big political donors. I want the best trained people doing this important work. And it's critical that the integrity of the Office of Secretary of State never be questioned. I want America to be a leader and an inspiration for civilized behavior in this new century. We will abide by the Geneva Conventions, which means we will not torture prisoners. Our sacred constitution requires a warrant before unreasonable searches, which includes our phone records. Let's enforce that, and while we're at it, allow Edward Snowden to come home. Extrajudicial assassinations by drone strikes are not working. Many blame them for the upheaval in Yemen. And Pakistan is far too important a player for us to antagonize 
with these nefarious activities. They are not worth the collateral damage and toxic hatred they spread. Let's stop them. For me, waging peace includes negotiating fair trade agreements that set standards for labor practices, environmental protections, preventing currency manipulation, and protection of intellectual property, among others. The Trans-Pacific Partnership has the potential to set fair guidelines for the robust commerce taking place in the Pacific Rim. Since the breakup of the Soviet Union, many of the former Soviet republics, especially Ukraine, have been caught in a tug of war between Europe and Russia. I believe stronger efforts should be made to encourage Russian integration into the family of advanced industrial nations with the objective of reducing tensions with, between Russia and its neighbors. To wage peace in our own hemisphere, I would repair relations with Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador. As part of that rapprochement, let's unite with all our experience to rethink the war on drugs. Obviously, eradication, substitution, and interdiction aren't working. Let's have an active, open-minded approach to drug trafficking that can corrupt everything from the courts to the banks to law enforcement in our hemisphere. And appropriately, the United Nations is planning a special General Assembly meeting next year on the subject. In this new American century, let's join the many countries who have banned capital punishment. Congratulations to Nebraska for your leadership. Earlier, I said, let's be bold. Here's a bold embrace of internationalism. Let's join the rest of the world and go metric. I happen to live in Canada and they completed the process. Believe me, it's easy. It doesn't take long before 34 degrees is hot. <laughs> Only Myanmar, Liberia, and the United States aren't metric, and it will help our economy. In this new American century, it's very important to have a ready and strong military. The eagle and our great seal holds both arrows and an olive branch. Let's lead responsibly with a commitment to our unwavering defense and our peaceful purposes. Nobel Peace Prize laureate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it best, I refuse to accept the cynical notion that nation after nation must spiral down a militaristic stairway into the hell of thermonuclear destruction. He asked, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Our challenges are many and formidable. Let's wage peace in this new American century. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you wanted to establish more FTAs as a way, like, you know, um, we establish trade, um, good trade agreements and protect intellectual property rights. So my question is, obviously, we can work out those agreements amongst other countries, but how would this affect with the U.S. in terms of, um, especially products like agriculture, because the U.S. heavily subsidizes its agricultural products and then in turn dumps it on these other economies to where the farmers and these other economies are trying to compete really, really hard to um, sell their products when the other people in their countries can easily just go buy the U.S. products because they're so much cheaper. So w in part of these trade agreements, would this involve the U.S. not um, dumping its subsidized agricultural products or any other subsidized products on the countries that we have the agreements with? Good question. What's your name? Olivia. Olivia, good question. Yes, I think that's the whole point, is to create a, 
I think that's the whole point, to create a, a level playing field on, on negotiating these free trade agreements. And that's exactly the point. And of course, many of these subsidies will take congressional action. And that is, uh, uh, so when I was in the United States Senate, something we certainly dealt with many, many times. Very, very controversial, some of these subsidies for agricultural products in particular. It's a good question. Hello. Oh, sorry. I'm ready. Okay. Um, if you do become president, what will your first priority be during your term? As I said uh, in my uh, statement here, of course, uh, domestic issues are critical. What's happening in our inner cities and, uh, and with our middle class and the disparity of wealth, well, what's happening with climate change, it's all very, very important. Uh, but of course, uh, right there at the top is uh, what's happening overseas also and some of these wars which are very expensive, very destructive, and as I said, uh, I think we entered into very, very unnecessarily under okay. false premises. So we've got to fix that, which then provides some of the opportunity and revenue uh, to put into more beneficial ways, in my view. Thank you. Good question. Yes, I've had a great record of supporting LGBT issues, and to me it wasn't only a civil rights issue, but also uh, a, an economic issue. And uh, you certainly want a tolerant society if you're going to attract the best people to stimulate your economy. And as, as governor, I pushed for um, marriage equality, gay marriage in my state. It took a while and it was a lot, very, very controversial. We finally got it through. Uh, but I always argue not only was it fair in a civil rights issue and doing the right thing, but it was going to help our economy. And the same is relevant to your question about the military. We want the best. And uh, to your question about transgendered, absolutely. We want the best fighting men and women in our military. So you would look at that? Yes. First, Governor, after announcing your candidacy for the Democratic nomination, I'm sure you've thought a lot about the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the messages about the growing problem of income inequality. First, what do you think it means to be a progressive and do you consider yourself a progressive? And second, what would you do to solve the growing problem of inequality in the United States? Well, that's a, the, the, one of the key questions of uh, our time now, what's, what's happening with the struggling Americans trying to get by and the uh, college tuitions and the debt they come out of college with, the income inequality, while many, many Americans are doing just fabulously. And uh, I think the key was when I came into the Senate, we had previous administrations going back to H.W. Bush, George H.W. Bush and President Bill Clinton had fought to get to surpluses. And President Bush came in with Richard Cheney and all of a sudden they had these monstrous tax cuts, $1.6 trillion tax cuts which favored the wealthy. It made no sense to me. And I voted against every single one of those Bush-Cheney tax cuts when they came in because we finally got to surpluses. The last thing I wanted to do, and the wealthy were doing just fine, is get back into deficits and widen that disparity of wealth. And so that it's, a lot of it is in, is in tax policy, how you address this income equality. There's a lot of uh, other ways, raising the minimum wage, which I voted for time and time again. I think every time I was in the Senate and as governor, we raised it three times uh, in my administration. And so there are different ways, but certainly tax policy is one of the very, very important ways to address our disparity of wealth and good education, making sure we keep our tuitions down so people can afford to go not only to the local George Masons of the world, uh, but community colleges and uh, all the public institutions with low tuitions. That's what made America great, being able to go to your local public institution of higher education and not come out with enormous debt. Thank you. Thank you for a good question. Let me go to a different part of the room if I could. intervention I found uh, quite interesting. What are your thoughts about using the military uh, to prevent uh, genocide and crimes against humanity? For example, uh, uh, President Obama's decision to bomb ISIL when they were attempting to exterminate uh, the Yazidis on Mount Sinjar. 
especially when every there are no U.S. Is different. material interests involved. Every place is different, and how you intervene is going to depend on the location. Uh, when I was in the Senate, uh, we had a, uh, many librarians were in Lo uh, Rhode Island. We have one of the largest Liberian populations in West, uh, Liberian West Africa in Rhode Island. And so I was very interested what was happening in Liberia, the Civil War, and uh, through a little bit of intervention, mostly by the United Nations, I'd say, the United Nations coming into Liberia, they were able to stop that long, brutal, horrendous Civil War in Liberia. So it, de it depends on the location and how we're going to intervene. Right now, uh, after a loss of credibility, uh, no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, uh, it, I think it's difficult for the United States uh, to intervene uh, because of that tremendous loss of credibility that we have in the region. American allies in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia and Israel, have expressed um, hesitation, apprehension, even hostility towards American policies in the region. With this idea of waging peace, what role do you see American allies, not just in the Middle East, but in Europe, Asia, globally, what role do you see them playing? That's the key, another key question that we face right now. Uh, that's the, the big international question. How do we fix this? Uh, the neocons that gave us their chaos, that they, everything's going according to plan. Uh, and my fear, as I said, that these same people that advocated for this are now advising other presidential campaigns, including uh, the main Democratic candidate. Uh, and so uh, to your question, uh, it's going to take uh, uh, international cooperation, whether it's, as you mentioned, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Iran, Russia, uh, everybody in the region, Pakistan, uh, the United States, Europeans, and uh, uh, that's my proposal. And we reinvigorate the United Nations and see what we can come out of those uh, discussions. We certainly have chaos in the region right now and across North Africa. Liberia, in Libya, what's happening in Libya, in Boko Haram, in Nigeria. All right, so you mentioned that um, the way our nation has been approaching the war on drugs isn't working. Uh, what do you believe is the best course of action to approaching? Well, I don't, to be honest. Uh, I, I want to listen to those people in the neighborhood. Uh, and as I said, the United Nations is going to have next year uh, a special general assembly on the issue. I think that's exactly what should be happening. And let's get in and combine our collective thoughts on what has worked, what hasn't. Uh, certainly eradication, uh, many of the countries are banning that, they're spraying, they don't want it anymore. Uh, interdiction, uh, some of the countries, I think Ecuador has kicked us out of our uh, post on the, on the seashore of uh, Ecuador. Uh, and it's a, a substitution. It's the common sense of if you can make more money growing one thing, uh, it's going to be hard to substitute for something you're not uh, growing. So those have been the key of our approach to the drug trafficking. And so I think get us all together. Uh, Uruguay is doing some very revo uh, uh, revolutionary things with their laws regarding uh, this trafficking. But without a doubt what I said, the, the, the corruption that gets into the courts, into the banks, into the law enforcement, undermines everything that we want to happen, everything good that we can ha want to happen in the region. Hi. Uh, I just had a question. Um, how would you help the working poor, uh, those who are truly suffering in the United States, the homeless, um, persons with mental illness, and also how would you decrease the huge amount of people who are in prison and being every year more and more and more being imprisoned in the United States? As I said, I like when I when I talk about helping in different ways, and I said in my speech, helping disadvantaged Americans, that's the population you're talking about, I like to be able to find a way to pay for it. How are we going to pay for those beneficial social programs? How are we going to pay for good educational programs? How are we going to pay for that safety net? So what I'm proposing here uh, is how to pay for it. Let's get out of these wars and redirect those funds and those revenues back to growing the middle class and giving the disadvantaged Americans 
new Americans, Native Americans on the reservations a better life. We can do it. Hello, Governor. I'm glad you just brought that up. Earlier on in your statement, you mentioned that you wanted to reform the relationship with Native Americans as well as new Americans. What specific ideas do you have for this relationship, and how does it apply to your platform? Well, uh, the, for new Americans, a path to citizenship is the first thing we want to accomplish for the 11 million or so that are out there living in the shadows. Uh, get a path to citizenship. And I was one of the original uh, co-sponsors of the bill back when I was in the Senate, offered by John McCain from a border state of Arizona and Ted Kennedy. It was the McCain-Kennedy bill, path to citizenship. And there were only nine of us that originally sponsored it. And I was one of the proud to be one of the nine, the bipartisan group, by the way. And so that's the first thing for the Native Americans on a reservation, deep, deep social issues that we have to address. And it always takes resources and, and a caring and a commitment. And I, I believe we as Americans should do that. Hello, Governor. Uh, many nations and experts across the globe have set the standard of global warming to be below two degrees centigrade. What policies would you enact or propose to make sure the United States does its fair share in meeting this standard? It, the first way to address climate change is in our power plants. That's the, the, mo the, the biggest way we can address uh, climate change and the carbon dioxide coming out of our electricity generating power plants. And when I was in the Senate, we, uh, Tom Carper from Delaware and I, we had a bill to do that, uh, Carper Chafee bill. And as I mentioned, President Bush had promised uh, to uh, designate carbon dioxide as a pollutant, the fourth pollutant. He promised in a campaign speech. And I'll tell a quick story. His, uh, he made uh, the former governor of New Jersey, Governor Whitman, his EPA d administrator. And Governor Whitman, Administrator Whitman, when then started to go around the uh, country on Sunday talk shows and the like, talking about how we're, gonna regulate, we're going to regulate carbon dioxide. And I was at a Republican, uh, back when I was a Republican, a Republican breakfast with the senators and Vice President Cheney attended. And this is in the very early days, about a month into the administration. Uh, Governor Whitman had been going around, and the senators were all over, the Republican senators were all over the Vice President, Vice President Cheney. What is Christie talking about carbon dioxide? And he finally stood up and he said, look, I'm gonna come out with my new energy policy, and we're not going to regulate carbon dioxide. I just about fell off my chair. All the other senators stood up and started cheering, yeah, yeah, cheering. And uh, wait a sec, didn't you promise in the campaign, didn't the Governor Whitman just take you on your word? So when I talk about not trusting them on mass weapons of mass destruction, uh, that was a big reason why I didn't. You don't go before the people and say something when you're campaigning and then change it just weeks into your administration. And so to answer your question, how we, how we address climate change, the biggest way is through putting carbon dioxide as a pollutant on the electricity generating power plants around the country. It's a major cause right now. Mr. Governor. Hope Mr. I answered Governor, your question. As you work towards moving from chaos to community, do you have any plans to promote racial integration in America, and in particular to tackle the problems of housing discrimination and residential segregation that has been going on for about 100 years now? Yes, to think that I quoted Dr. Martin Luther King in 1964, and all the work that the nonviolent marches did and all the benefits that came out of that and we're still struggling with this issue. We just have to refocus and, I, and, and what's happened in Baltimore, what's happened in Ferguson, what's happened in North Charleston helps us to refocus on this issue. In my view, the short-term fixes are, don't work. The zero tolerance types of things, they don't work and we see, we see that. It's going to be a long-term approach and my view is education, investment in education in these inner cities. And a lot of that has to do with career and technical schools now. Different opportunities. Let's, let's mix in the opportunities what uh, are now called career and technical schools. A big effort on getting our youngsters to stay through on something that they like, enjoy, and give them those options. And career and technical schools can't do that. Good new initiative that's occurring. A rethinking of how we I can keep these youngsters from getting into the gangs and the hopelessness and the disenfranchisement. 
and then the brutality of the police that occurs by a few of them as, as, the, as they struggle with these gang issues. Um, Governor? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, recently there was a controversy over Hillary Clinton's email scandal um, or server. How do you feel about this and what are your thoughts on transparency? As I said, I, I think our diplomatic uh, core right now, because of what happened with the lies and the prevarications on weapons of mass destructions and how other countries naturally, why should they trust us? We weren't honest with them. We got into this war on false pretenses. And so our State Department has to just be above all controversy. And uh, it's regret regrettable to me what's happening now with emails, with the, the foundation that affects decision making, the coming out of state. Uh, we just can't have that. We have to repair our credibility. And it starts with a diplomatic corps. Hello. Um, we need to re just get back the respect and admiration of the international community. We still have a lot of it, right? but we, we squandered a lot also. Hi. Earlier you mentioned that stronger efforts should be made to help normalize relationships between Russia and its Eastern European neighbors. What specifically would some of those examples of things to be, you know, things that could be done, would that be? Would that be possibly reconsidering Russia's continued action to the SWIFT international banking system or lifting sanctions against Russia? What, what are some of your thoughts on these issues? Yeah, good questions. Give me specifics, right? <laughs> well, I was lucky after I left the Senate and I worked to, at the Brown uh, Watson Institute for International Studies, and while I was there, I also served on a board uh, that advised Ukraine on good government issues. And so I've been there maybe a dozen times and to Kiev and Lviv in the, in the west and then Donetsk in the east where all the fighting is now. And I, I, every time I went there, I had this feeling about this tug of war. And it said, it, it, to me, it just didn't make sense. The Cold War's over. The, the, the Berlin Wall has come down. Let, let's integrate Russia. So we, these other countries aren't in this tug of war going on. And how do we do that? Uh, first, just don't make mistakes. And I think we made some mistakes with Russia. Uh, at, at one time, as I said, we had, uh, before September 11th, uh, the possibility of a very, very peaceful world. And maybe I could just take a second, if I could. It helps answer this question. Uh, when I was in the Senate, the Prime Minister of Italy came to address us in a joint session. So congressmen and senators got there. And this is what the Prime Minister said. It's a little long, but I think it helps address your question. In 2001, so this is uh, in the, uh, before September 11th, in the early days of my second government, I was called to chair the G8 summit in Genoa. After the conclusion of the summit's official program, the final dinner became a dinner among friends. At one point that evening, it's the Prime Minister saying that, and I'm sitting in my chair in the uh, House of Representatives listening to him, he said, at one point that evening, I sat back slightly from the table, almost an external observer, in order to enjoy the cordial discussion among the leaders of the largest industrial countries of the world. President Bush was chatting amiably with Prime Minister Kazumi of Japan. Pearl Harbor and Hiroshima were but a distant memory. Prime Minister Blair was joking with Chancellor Schroeder. And the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, was also talking with President Bush. The tragedy of the Second World War and the Cold War, which had lasted for so many years, was forgotten. I felt great pleasure inside. I thought the world had, in fact, changed, and how different and peaceful was the world we were handing to our children. An age of lasting peace beckoned. I'm sitting in my chair listening to him say that, and I'm saying, that's exactly how I felt. Bush and Schroeder and Putin and Kazumi and uh, Blair and, and I go, my gosh. And he includes Putin. So we had a chance. Everybody getting together. We made some mistakes. We presented when the restart button had the wrong label on the restart button. That was a big mistake in my view. Diplomatic. You remember that incident? Uh, so just have more repair work to do. Get back uh, and, and, and try and get back to what the Prime Minister of Italy talked about there. We can do it. We had it in our hand at one time. An age of lasting peace for our children. <laughs> what could be better than that? 
Governor, earlier uh, during your speech, you mentioned that uh, switching to the metric sy system is beneficial for our economy. Also, um, I mean, that such switch would require um, changes um, road signs nationwide as well as um, modification of speedometers. How would you explain that to an average, average American as, as well as um, how, how would it be beneficial for our economy? I think there's a couple of things here. One, it's, it's a symbolic uh, integration of ourselves into the international community after the mistakes of the last 10, 15, 10, 14 years and the, uh, the mistakes that we have made and, uh, internationally. So it's, a, it's symbolic that we're, we're going to uh, do something different here in the United States. And then, of course, for the economy. And uh, the scientists are all working in metric because they have to deal internationally. And it's just very hard. For, for many of our exporters and, and businesses to have to deal with uh, two uh, ways of measuring. And so uh, economically, we'll help pay for these signs. And that, of course, that question's a natural. Of all the things we have to do in this country, how can you talk about changing signs and the cost that will come with it? But the economic benefit will help pay for that. And why would Canada do it? I was there in Canada when they did it. Why would they do it if there wasn't an economic benefit? 34 is hot. Yes, sir. Hi, Governor. Um, just to kind of elaborate on that, um, switching to the metric system, as he was kind of saying, is that's hundreds of millions, possibly I would say fairly is billions of dollars um, on the expense of the American economy. And our current scientists are already using, you know, the metric system because they're scientists and they have to use that just for world assimilation in terms of the scientific community. So is it necessarily worth it to put a, a fairly strenuous economic burden on the economy just to switch over to the metric system? And, you know, would that be worth it? Okay, similar question. Uh, and I'm not saying we have to do it tomorrow, but I think it should be something we should aspire to in this new American century that I'm talking about, where we, we reach out to the rest of the world, and we're not un arrogant and unilateral as, as uh, some would propose we be. And it's always America's way or the highway. And it, it's a symbolic, and I don't, just don't think Canada wouldn't have done it if the cost was that high. It's not that hard. I hear you, though. There's a cost involved. I would argue the be economic benefits would outweigh it and the symbolic benefits. Mr. Governor, you've stated um, in the last couple of minutes that you feel we should bolster the diplomatic core and also reinvigorate the UN. How would you suggest that we address doing this given the recent American Academy of Diplomacy report on the diplomacy at risk and the systematic blurring of the foreign and civil service as a result of the QDDR? And also the Senate's obstinacy in ratifying the Rome Statutes and the International Human Rights Commission. You got into some good specifics there. Uh, I will say that I, I think it was Secretary Gates, former Secretary Gates, said our foreign, foreign policy is too militarized. And that's kind of what I'm saying also. Uh, we need to rethink our Department of State and how we act around the world. And, and, and become good listeners. And it's so important. These people are so skilled. When I, I served on the Foreign Relations Committee, I was lucky to travel around the country. And these people in these embassies, these young people coming up through the Foreign Service, they're so knowledgeable what's happening on the ground in these countries. And they're extremely valuable to what I would pose to our efforts to wage peace. I want to empower them. Think if you work for your whole career and somebody that having to give a you bundle a, whole, a bunch of millions of dollars comes in above you and becomes the ambassador of the country that you've been waiting. I just don't think that's right. Hi, Governor. Um, so you've spoken a lot on foreign policy, and uh, right now China is one of the key players in the global economy, and U.S.-China relations are more important than ever. So what's your view on China and its economic growth, its human rights record, and what do you envision for the future of U.S.-China <laughs> relations? They're kind of like the America that just uh, of the Industrial Revolution. They're just uh, they're growing so fast, 
And so we just have to understand that, the, the speed uh, of what's happening in that country. And I, I just think with understanding what's happening in their country and constant dialogue, I, I think we're doing a lot of the right things. I know that, of course, what's happening with the uh, South China Sea and some of the islands there, but we just keep working at good dialogue and some of the currency manipulation issues that we have and uh, how we can have uh, mutually beneficial programs is the, is the key. Okay, way in the back for the. Uh, my question is: Do you think America has a responsibility to um, to help developing nations? For example, Nepal, which which just had a dev devastating earthquake, uh, to come to develop their, their their nation and help the economy grow. And and if so, how would you, if you were, if you were elected, how would you? show that you are doing something in order to help these developing nations? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Uh, we have a role to play by virtue of our uh, enormous economy that we have here and our great technology that we have in this country. Uh, so we have that responsibility. But ultimately, I th I'm a big advocate of internationalism and, uh, and reinvigorating the United, United Nations. And that's an area that they excel with UNICEF and the different programs they have in helping in earthquakes and uh, tsunami and uh, different things like disasters around the world. Uh, but we certainly, by virtue of our uh, strength economically, have a major ro role to play. And we have. We have over the years. Mr. Governor, we have over 11 million undocumented immigrants here in America who struggle every day to find work, who face social discrimination, um, and they're here just to find the American dream. What policy issues would you would you try to pass, or immigration reform would you try to see see through so that these immigrants can find proper life here in America? I mentioned earlier that McCain Kennedy. It's it's old, but I was just looking at it the other day, and it's still relevant. It had all the parameters that help it get passed. I don't know why we couldn't get it passed back then, but it's a not only a path to citizenship, but yet citizenship, but you have your border security. I think there was a, uh, a, a, some funding to help learn English. It had all the, all the pieces uh, that, are, that are good and to uh, thwart some of the criticisms of helping our uh, people that live in the shadow get back into paying taxes and uh, into the normal life that we want everybody to have here. Okay. So that's it. Uh, the president of the United States for the Democratic nomination. What to the Democrats? What differentiates you from Martin O'Malley, Bernie Sanders, and Hillary Clinton? I'd like to say it's really three things. It's your your record, which I have a 30-year record at the local level. I was a councilman, a mayor, and then at the state level, I was a governor, and then at the federal level, I was a senator. So it's your record. I open my record to scrutiny, and then it's your character. I open my uh, my trustworthiness over that 30 years and to fulfilling what I say on the campaign trail to what I do when I'm elected. And then uh, thirdly, your vision. And hopefully I've outlined a little bit here of my vision of where America fits in the world and what, how we can then use that better to help us here domestically. Your record, that's what it should be judged on. How have you performed? And your character. Have you been ethical? And then what's your vision? I think those are the three keys. And I, elections are about choices, and that's the way it should be. Okay. I'm happy to join the, the choices out there. Thank you very much. And that's the way it should be. Okay. I'm happy to join the, the choices out there. <laughs> <laughs>